The second candle in the Advent wreath is the candle of peace. As the angels say in the Christmas gospel, glory to God in the highest and peace to God's people on earth. The second Sunday in Advent is also the week that we hear from John the Baptist, the fiery preacher who called for justice. A voice crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. There's a connection between peace and justice. In 1972, during the celebration for the Day of Peace, Pope Paul VI said, If you want peace, work for justice. The two go hand in hand. Or to put it another way, there will be no peace when people suffer injustice. Think about what peacekeepers do. Our military and diplomats deploy around the world in order to keep the peace. But their main mission is to work for justice, to straighten out what is crooked and to right what is wrong, to level the inequities of wealth and poverty power, and subjugation. Unjust societies produce unrest, and unrest leads to war, not peace. It's easy to see that overseas, but what about peace and justice at home? There's been a lot of unrest on our city streets this year. As consequential as the COVID crisis is, and it is incredibly consequential, it will pass we will eventually see this crisis as a year of living dangerously, and then it will largely be gone. But think about the protests that followed the deaths of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd, to name a few. Deaths rooted in centuries of prejudice and injustice for which there is no vaccine. Why can't we all just get along? Why can't there be peace on earth? The hope of Advent is that there can be. That there can be peace on earth when people of goodwill work for justice. When we heed the words of John the Baptist to straighten the crooked paths, to level the heights of prejudice and power, and raise the valleys of inequity. When we prepare the way of the Lord, the Prince of Peace. And so we light the second candle and pray for peace as we work for justice. And we hope, like people of goodwill have done for centuries, that the day will dawn when there will be glory to God in the highest and peace to God's people on earth. Welcome to worship. Welcome to Lord of Life. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
our fear while the evening deepens. Holy light, form our night, form the time of winter. Holy light, form our night, warm the time. mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Let us pray. Stir up our hearts, Lord God, to prepare the way of your only Son. By his coming, strengthen us to serve you with purified lives through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, 
who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to Mark. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I'm sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the Gospel of the Lord. I hate most commercials. 
I think the DVR was a great invention because I can skip through all those ads that are trying to convince me of things that aren't true. I'm not getting older. I'm getting better. Okay, I am getting older and not necessarily better. But every once in a while, there is an ad that makes me stop, watch, and smile. Maybe even hit the repeat button because it's so clever and memorable. Like Volkswagen's Think Small campaign. Or when Wendy's asked us to think big by asking, where's the beef? I've been an Apple customer since the Macintosh was first introduced during the 1984 Super Bowl in an ad that spoofed the George Orwell book, 1984. Do you remember watching it? It's a classic. And one of the ads that I miss most is Joe Isuzu. Remember him? That slick salesman who told the truth about advertising by lying about what he was selling. It would be like me looking you in the eye right now and saying that I'm speaking off the cuff and completely candidly. Well, as my dad would have said, what's this have to do with all the rice in China? What possible connection can there be between an advertising spokesperson and today's gospel? Well, today's gospel has a spokesperson. His name is John the Baptist, and he is the epitome of truth in advertising. He tells it like it is. No bull, no baloney, no fake news, and no endless lies. In the words of Howard Cosell, John tells it like it is. Get ready, people. Get set. You've asked God to straighten out this crooked world, and that's exactly what God is going to do. Every valley will be exalted, and every hill and mountain brought low. God will make a level playing field that's fair for all, not just for some. John the Baptist would never make it on Madison Avenue. And to be honest, we probably wouldn't be that comfortable with John in our own homes. The Bible says he wore a coat of camel's hair. That sounds awfully scratchy to me. And he ate locusts and wild honey. I'd have to be pretty hungry and take a lot of honey before I'd eat a locust. John's depicted in art as an eccentric ascetic, a loner who doesn't fit in, but that's the point. He doesn't try to fit into our image of success. He's not a slick-talking salesman or a sly-tongued politician. John's mission is to break through the alternative reality that we've created, the commercial crassness that we buy into the social lies and conspiracies created to support our worldview, to confront us with a simple truth. Life's not fair. Not because God made it that way, but because we do. And it needs to change. But before change can happen, we have to come clean about truth itself. If John the Baptist is going to tell it like it is, then we need to be able to hear it like it is. In 2016, the Oxford Dictionaries declared that the word of the year was post-truth. Post-truth means that public opinion is shaped more by emotional appeals than objective facts. In other words, I believe what I believe because I believe it. Don't confuse me with the facts. Since then, some of the words of the year have been toxic, gaslighting, and unprecedented. Do you see a trend moving from fact to fiction? Joe Azuzu was way ahead of his time. 
He'd be right at home in our world today. But instead of seeing through his lying lips, we might take every word as gospel truth. Scientists worldwide agree that by wearing a mask, washing our hands, and maintaining our distance, we can reduce the risk of the pandemic. But who do I believe? A thousand experts? Or the one who says it's all a hoax? I don't know about you, but I'd rather hear the truth even when the truth is inconvenient. Maybe especially when it's inconvenient. I had a relative once who was quite corpulent. That's a fancy word for fat. When her doctor told her to lose weight, you know what she did? She went to a different doctor. This year, the Oxford Dictionaries didn't even choose a word of the year because they said there were just too many. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, 2020 is, quote, a year that has left us speechless. It started with the word pandemic and coronavirus, lockdown, flattening the curve, stay at home, But as this year comes to a close, we still can't agree on what's fact and what's fiction. No wonder this year has left us speechless. John the Baptist does have something to say about that. And he doesn't need subtitles. There is no fine print at the bottom of the page, no slick advertising or limited time offer, just the facts, ma'am. John says, prepare the way. Straighten what's crooked. Right what's wrong. Fix what's broken. One day God will raise every valley of inequity and bring down every hill and mighty mountain until there is a level playing field and life is fair for all. Our job, John says, is to prepare the way for that day. This Thanksgiving, there were long lines at food pantries. Some of the people on the receiving end had been volunteers on the giving end in better times. Millions of people are still unemployed, and those benefits run out at the end of the month. Hospitals are overwhelmed. The number of COVID cases doubled from October to November, And more than a quarter million people have died. Last summer, you may have heard of somebody that died. Earlier this fall, you may have known somebody that died. By now, you probably have lost a family member or neighbor to COVID-19. There is light at the end of the tunnel. Safe and effective vaccines are coming, but we're not out of the tunnel yet. The days are still growing shorter and the darkness deepens. That's the truth. But that's not the whole truth. Because the good news is that people are preparing the way by leveling the field. We're all in this together. So along with overwhelming need, there is incredible generosity. The food banks have food because you give. The hospitals are staffed because our health care workers are committed to patient care. And there may even be some goodwill in Washington to renew at least some of the benefits. That would truly be a Christmas miracle. One day God will sort it out and right what's wrong. That's what the gospel says. In the meantime, God has sent a spokesperson with a simple message. It's not slick. It's not complicated. Do what you can do to prepare the way of the Lord. Amen.
Let us proclaim our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our response to the prayers of the people is, Your mercy is great. God of power and might, Comfort your people and come quickly to this weary world. Hear our prayers for everyone in need. Faithful God, you teach us to wait for you with faithfulness and patience. Sustain and support us in our doubts and our questions. Nurture our faith as we discern and partner with you in your mission. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Loving God, you set the stars in the sky and breathe life into the earth. Renew the face of creation where it is in need of your healing touch. Mend the wounds of environmental damage and restore balance to ecosystems so that all creation can declare your praise. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Steadfast God, you never tire of seeking justice. Where people suffer from discrimination, judgment, and injustice, speak words of truth and comfort. Lead us toward a world where faithfulness will sprout underfoot and righteousness rain down from above. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Nurturing God, you accompany those who answer your calling Empower the community of Peace Lutheran Church in Peoria and their pastor, Al Castle. Give them faithful hearts and wisdom for their journey in service to you. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Leading God, you ask us to make uneven ground smooth. Make equality from the disparities of your people. Sustain and support people with physical and intellectual disabilities. Accompany disability advocates who work for a world accessible to all. Teach us to celebrate the great diversity in our midst. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Tender God, you know sorrow and joy alike. We pray for those in our families and congregation who are not joyful this holiday season. Comfort those who grieve. Be a companion to all who are lonely. Tend to those who are sick or struggling with depression. And gather all people in your healing presence. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Eternal God, we give thanks for the saints who have prepared your way in the wilderness and taught us to continue their faithful work. Make their generous lives an example for all. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Draw near to us, O God, and receive our prayers for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. You comforted your people with the promise of the Redeemer, through whom you will also make all things new in the day when he comes to judge the world in righteousness. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy One, the beginning and the end, the giver of life, blessed are you for the birth of creation. Blessed are you in the darkness and in the light. Blessed are you for the promise to your people. Blessed are you in the prophet's hopes and dreams. Blessed are you for Mary's openness to your will. Blessed are you for your son Jesus, the word made flesh. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks, broke it, and gave it for all to eat, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And then after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. With this bread and cup, we remember your word dwelling among us, full of grace and truth. We remember our new birth in his death and resurrection, and we looked with hope for his coming. Come, Lord Jesus. Holy God, we long for your spirit. Come among us. Bless this meal. May your word take flesh in us. Awaken your people. Fill us with your light. Bring the gift of peace on earth. Come, Holy Spirit. All praise and glory are yours, Holy One of Israel, Word of God incarnate, power of the Most High, one God, now and forever. Amen. We pray the prayer as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The body of Christ given for you and the blood of Christ poured out for you. May the body and blood of our precious Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you forever in his grace and peace. Amen. Our benediction today is this, that the Lord bless you and keep you. 
The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.